For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Those words, the beginning of that verse, by themselves, are not, nothing, are not anything all that extraordinary. For every day around the world, sons are born into families, thousands upon thousands of sons born into families around the world. Then comes the extraordinary. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Have you ever looked at a newborn in their crib and said to yourself, that baby is going to carry the weight of kings and governments on his or her shoulders? Have you ever looked at a little baby, an infant, curled up on its mother's shoulder with, with its little shoulders there and thought to yourself, that child can carry the weight of kings and governments? Wouldn't be so when you look at a baby boy, but today we, with Isaiah, with eyes of faith, we peek into the manger, and there we see with pounding heart more than just Son of Mary. This is the Son of God, the one that was promised from the very fall into sin in the Garden of Eden. And the government will be on his shoulders. It says he will be the son of God, the king of kings. He will be a wonderful counselor. He will be called wonderful counselor. I think as I grew up reciting those words, I often thought of that as someone who's going to be, be that person who can give you little tidbits of information to help you through your daily life. A counselor, someone who sits across the table from you and might help you with a certain challenge of getting through that certain struggle. When it refers to a wonderful counselor in the Bible, it's talking about a king who holds counsel. What does a king do in his throne room? He holds counsel. And there he makes decrees and he makes righteous judgments. Hope. Oh. That's what this king came to do that we find in a manger. The Israelites had come into this wonderful land called the land of Israel. God had given them this land flowing with milk and honey, and it didn't take too long, and they were unsatisfied with the land flowing with milk and honey. They wanted to be like everyone else. They wanted a king, a wonderful counselor. They wanted a king for themselves, but pretty quickly this arrangement did not work out for them. In fact, the very first king that God gave them named King Saul, King Saul tried to kill his own son. King Saul killed, tried to kill his successor, the anointed one of God, a guy we know as King David. The kings of Israel would call the prophets or the pastors of their day, they would call them troublers of Israel. Oh, here comes that troubler of Israel who's going to tell... Tell us what God has to say. Finally, towards the end of that arrangement, as it got closer and closer to the Messiah being born, this is what God spoke through the prophet Micah. Why do you now cry aloud? Have you no king? Has your counselor perished? Their choice to turn from God to an earthly king had backfired. The earthly king only led them astray, often leading them astray spiritually. The earthly king, they made decrees that were human decrees, that were flawed human decrees, past human judgments that were often flawed. And ultimately, those kings would die. And their tombs would be sealed up, and those tombs were there to the days of Jesus. But this wonderful counselor is altogether different. This wonderful counselor from God will make perfect and righteous judgments. And we say good because we need a leader. We need a perfect and righteous judge in this world, especially with all the trouble and conflict that we see around us today, the, the war and the destruction around us. We see the inhumane acts carried out one against another. We just saw an example of that this past week at the corner of Highway 54 and the tollway. Inhumane acts of brutality. 
carried out in broad daylight. You say, good, this is the kind of leader that we need in this world today. Christmas is only an all too short reprieve and rest from all of the trouble and conflict, conflict and sorrow and death in this world. We need this kind of leader, we say, a righteous and perfect judge. That would be wonderful. That would be wonderful if his subjects, if his creatures were righteous and perfect as well. If we kept all of his decrees, but you know as well as I, that we do not. There is no one who keeps God's righteous judgments and his decrees perfectly. For that, God should judge us. We have made our own judgments of others apart from God's word or not according to God's word for those sins and many others we should be punished. We should fall in terror before this righteous and wonderful counselor of God. If we were to go into his throne room we should fall down terrified. In fact that's what happened to Isaiah. There was a, an occasion that Isaiah tells us about in Isaiah chapter 6 where he went in a vision into the throne room of God and all he had to say was, Woe to me, I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips and an unclean heart. I'm going to die. Then God sent an angel to him, an angel who took an, a hot coal from an altar. An altar is for sacrifice. He took this hot coal from the altar and he touched that hot coal to Isaiah's mouth and he said, See, your guilt has been taken away. Your sin has been atoned for. Isaiah got up and he was a changed man. He said, here am I, send me, Lord, knowing that his sins were forgiven. Or there was one other occasion where a man, a man fell terrified before God in the presence of Jesus and his eyes a blazing fire that sees all, that sees everything inside of our hearts. He fell down, the Apostle John fell down before God, terrified. But Jesus came and touched him on the shoulder and said, do not be afraid. I am the one who was dead, but now I am alive. Look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. See, your wonderful counselor is also your mighty God. And that means that he can conquer death itself. The sting of death no longer holds the sway that it once held over us. Sadly, so often we act as though this mighty God is not all that wonderful. Our hectic schedules in the holiday season overwhelm us. Family and friends, perhaps, we feel have let us down. Maybe things aren't turning out the way that we want them to at home or in the workplace. We begin to mope through life as though this mighty God is not a wonderful counselor, that he would allow these things to come into my life. The weight of our sin begins to weigh us down, and we try, we try to get rid of the weight of our sin by maybe making up for our sin before God, but we will never be able to do that. This wonderful counselor is also mighty God, stands in his throne room, and there in the foreground before you stands a cross. A cross between you and the wonderful counselor who is also mighty God. And he says, see, see that cross? Do you see what it means? Do you see the extent of my love for you? See how much I love you. See that I have conquered your greatest enemies of sin and death and hell. See that I would never allow anything into your life that would harm you spiritually. Will I let you down? Will I lead you astray? Have I not promised that I will work everything out for your good? There stands the cross to give proof to us of how much he loves us and how we can be sure of his promises. His promise especially that he will work everything out for our good. There is something more. He 
is not only a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, this next name also helps us to take a step back and to see the bigger picture of Christmas. He is the everlasting Father. We get so focused on this year and this holiday and this meal that's going to be served or this gift that's going to be given or this illness that's in my life or this that illness that's in the life of my loved one. We get so focused on the details of the present and the here and now. And God also encourages us to take a step back and to look at things from the bigger picture to ask ourselves. Are the details that I'm worried about and so concerned about in the here and now, are they going to matter in everlasting life? <clears throat> For those tasks that God, and God has given us many good tasks in this life, and they can, weary, they can make us weary and tired. But when we get weary, Isaiah also has this to say, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired and weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Strength to the weary and increases, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God says, come and find rest in the manger and at the cross. See how I have finished the work of accomplishing your salvation. We see that we can let all the details of today fade into the distance. Just focus on what he comes to really bring us. And that is that last name that sums up all of Christmas. He is the Prince of Peace. Peace. Isn't that what we long for in our everyday life? Isn't that what we long for that we're pursuing in our everyday life? Peace. We're on a constant quest for peace in our homes and in our relationships with family and with friends and with our neighbors. We're in a constant quest for and it seems like when, when that relationship with maybe a spouse or a loved one, a family member, doesn't get straightened out or ironed out, we think, then we can't have any peace. Or maybe when I don't get that new job or that new promotion, or, or maybe that illness doesn't go away like I prayed for it to go away, then and I can't have peace. But today, God reminds us that through Jesus, when you know Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, you have peace. The peace of knowing that you have forgiveness, life, and salvation. You have peace now and into eternity. Apart from Jesus, you will have to bear the weight of the burden of your sin and all the worries of this life. You will have to bear, them on, burden, bear the burden on your own. But with Jesus, you have someone who carries those burdens for you. He takes them to the cross and they are shattered there on the ground. And so today our caroling is winding down. Our caroling is coming to an end. Just like those shepherds eventually went back to their homes, to their everyday life, we too are going to go back after our Christmas celebration today and tomorrow we're going to go back to our everyday life. We also see that these names that are given to the Son of God and the message of Christmas cannot be drowned out by the broken world that is around us. The baby in the manger is more than just a baby. He is wonderful, a wonderful counselor who has a cross there in the foreground before you. He is a mighty God who overcame death and said, proclaims to you, because I live, you also will live. He is an everlasting Father who has all the details of your life planned out to bring you close to Him now and for eternity. And He is a Prince of Peace. He gives peace that this world cannot give. Because He has conquered our greatest enemies of sin and death and hell. I want to leave you with one last passage from Isaiah. It says, they will enter Zion, the presence of God, 
with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. We look forward to that in eternity, but we have that in the here and now. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. What a beautiful verse. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. Doesn't that so much describe the holiday season of many sorrows and often sighing? But we have this to look forward through, through the Son of God. Sorrow and sigh will flee away. God bless your Christmas celebration. May you and yours have a blessed Christmas. In him who is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen.